New York's first ever woman governor took the helm this week. The Delta variant continues to be a concern here in the capital region. The ongoing situation in Afghanistan weighs heavily on our minds. On a lighter note, though, two other questions came up this week. What's happening to Captain the Dog? And are the rumors true? Are we actually getting a Chick-fil-A? Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the top headlines. First to second Trader Joe's, and now it looks like the capital region's northern suburbs will get a freestanding Chick-fil-A. We'll get the latest from the Capitol Bureau. I stand here as the 57th governor of New York. And we'll hear about how one of our reporters' search for a home led her to investigate local real estate scams. It just doesn't look good for you, pal. (laughs) Um, I'm definitely going to write about this. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. First up, let's go over what appeared this week in the Times Union and on timesunion.com. We are here once again with Times Union Editor-in-Chief Casey Seiler. We're going to talk headlines and news of the day. Let's start with the New York State trooper drowning in the Great Sakandaga Lake earlier this week. His death was ruled an accidental drowning, but could you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, a really terrible story about a trooper named James Monda, who had been on the force for almost two decades. He was 45 based out of Princetown, he was a member of a Marine patrol unit, had been for about the last four years, and he went into Great Sagandaga Lake wearing dive gear for reasons that the state police said are uh, currently under investigation. But obviously a, a, a terrible tragedy, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear more about the circumstances surrounding his death. Kathy Hochul, who took the office of governor on Tuesday, uh, you know, it's a, a a sad first, but it was the first time she ordered that uh, flags around the state be flown at half mast and in honor of Trooper Monda. It was a big week for the Capitol Bureau. I think we can say that uh, we have a new governor, among other things, and we'll have more on that in a bit. But the proverbial ghost of the previous governor still lingers. Uh, The State Ethics Oversight Commission is now asking Attorney General Letitia James to investigate a potentially illegal leak of confidential information from that commission to the former governor, Andrew Cuomo, two years ago. So tell us what's happening. Give us a summary. This is a complicated issue. So this is kind of a it's a two day matter, I guess you could say. On Wednesday, the state Senate committee held a hearing into ethics enforcement or the lack thereof in New York. And that, of course, included the role played or not played by the State Joint Commission on Public Ethics, JCOPE. The executive director of JCOPE, its top staffer, appeared. And, you know, he's new on the job, but attempted to, you know, defend the beleaguered office. He was followed by Julie Garcia. Now, Julie Garcia is really the whistleblower in this 2019 leak investigation that you were referring to. And this was a situation in which Jacob held a closed door meeting. Their deliberations are by law supposed to be secret. In January of 2019, immediately just a couple of hours after that meeting, Julie Garcia, who was an appointee of Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie, got a call from one of Hastie's top aides saying, hey, the speaker just got a call from the governor who was ticked off about the way uh, the speaker's appointees had voted in the matter that was dealt with in the Jacob meeting that had just occurred. That meeting, we know not from Julie Garcia, but from other sources, was on whether or not Jacob should investigate Joe Percoco's use of taxpayer resources during the governor's 2014 campaign that he was was essentially running the governor's reelection effort that year 
out of the governor's Manhattan gubernatorial offices. So Julie Garcia reported that apparent breach, you know, from Jacob to the governor, reported to Hasty, and then Hasty dispatched his aide to go talk to Julie Garcia about it. Garcia reported it to Jacob. Jacob referred it to the state inspector general's office for an investigation. The inspector general's office is run by Letizia Taliaferro, who is a close Cuomo ally. The investigation by the IG, which she recused herself because she used to work at Jacob, it was handed off to a deputy, never involved interviews, as far as we know, with Andrew Cuomo, Carl Hasty, or the Carl Hasty aide who called Julie Garcia. Julie Garcia, as soon as the IG released its investigation, saying that, wow, we can't authenticate whether or not a leak actually occurred. Julie Garcia quit in disgust, and she discussed that in this hearing on Wednesday and gave a a really eloquent and full-throated expression of, you know, what happens to a state when there are no ethical guardrails for powerful people. And I don't usually say this, but it's really something that all New Yorkers who care about effective good government ought to listen to. But what happens in government on the state level and on the federal level is when we turn our heads the other way, when we remain silent, we end up with 11 people who are victimized Mm -hmm. by a government that is abusive, bullying, condescending, threatening to ruin people's careers. That hearing, once again, was on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, Jacob Um, held a special meeting with Governor Cuomo's, former Governor Cuomo's appointees abstaining. They narrowly voted to refer both the question of whether or not there was a leak and the question of whether or not the IG's investigation was designed to be lackluster to Attorney General Letitia James's office. So that is now going to happen if James does, in fact, pick these matters up as investigations. That would mean that Letitia Taliaferro and Spencer Friedman, who was her deputy who handled the investigation, will have to answer under oath why exactly they thought it was a good idea for Cuomo Hasty and Hasty's aide not to be interviewed as part of this investigation. I frankly think it is very hard to imagine that the current administration at the IG's office will last too many weeks into Kathy Hochul's administration. Well, more on that. We'll be following that closely at our Capital Confidential section on timesunion.com. We'll have more on the new governor coming up later. Finally, something that many people have been waiting for, or at least waiting to hear a rumor about, Clifton Park might get a Chick-fil-A. Is that right? Yes, first to second Trader Joe's, and now it looks like the capital region's northern suburbs will get a freestanding Chick Fil A. This one would be uh, could be set up near the entrance of Clifton Park Center in uh, a space formerly occupied by a Pier One, and they say that if they get approval uh, within thirty to sixty days, they could set it up in quick order, and it could be handing out chicken sandwiches and whatnot. You know, I think by the end of the year, the beginning of, uh, of 2022, Chick-fil-A currently has its only capital region location in Albany International Airport. And uh, you and I have both heard stories about people who are so devoted, it's on the other side of the security checkpoint, that they will actually buy a cheap airline ticket, go in, buy a bunch of sandwiches for friends, and then just walk out again without actually traveling anywhere. And of course, Chick-fil-A, with a certain degree of controversy, is also going to be coming to uh, rest areas uh, all along our fine uh, interstate and throughway system, which elicited a a bit of pushback a couple of weeks ago from state lawmakers who note that Chick-fil-A used to have a corporate giving strategy that was uh, not appreciated by the LGBTQ community. Chick-fil-A says that it has changed up those policies and uh, and that it has bias against uh, against no one. Indeed, not without controversy, but you're right. I have never heard so many people like, so excited about going to the airport in my life. Indeed. 
All right. So now we are going to jump right in to some of the biggest news of the week, which is that we have a new governor. And Casey, you spoke to uh, Capitol Bureau Managing Editor Brendan Lyons earlier this week. So we are going to hear your conversation now. All right. It gives me great pleasure to be talking with Brendan Lyons, the Times Union's uh, managing editor for investigations, as well as our Capitol Bureau chief, and somebody who has been working fairly flat out for the last, geez, Brendan, what, about eight months now? (laughs) It feels like that sometimes. Yeah. So let's kind of run through the timeline of Governor Andrew Cuomo's exit, the final days, to quote a Woodward and Bernstein book uh, title. On Saturday, the governor was out of the executive mansion. Uh, He was staying at the home of his sister and brother-in-law. And there was, in perfectly dramatic uh, finale fashion, a hurricane bearing down upon uh, Long Island and New York City. And the governor on Saturday, you reported in an outstanding story that ran in the paper and print on Sunday, told his protective detail, stop following me around. That day, when they went to the Westchester County residence to get him, the governor opted, as he did apparently from time to time, to drive uh, an unmarked state police charger on his own, alone in the vehicle, which raises some questions in and of itself, whether that's appropriate or not. He went to his Manhattan office and gave his storm press conference. And following that, he told the members of his detail to no longer follow him. And he drove away in the state police vehicle. Now, his spokesman has claimed that, well, whenever he was in Albany, he often told them, hey, I'm just going out for a little ride. Don't follow me. But that's different. They would still follow the governor even then. They, that's their job and they will do it. This time, it was much different. He was relaying to them, I no longer want you around. And there had to be also an issue of his trust, because over the last, you know, several months, we've been able to get more and more information out to the public from detail members, current and former, about the mistreatment they faced, his abuses of that protective detail, his meddling in that protective detail. As you note, that was kind of the through line of your your Sunday report, which described in in really a kind of amazing granular detail how the protective detail had, and not just under Cuomo, but I think it's fair to say that it became something of a chronic issue under Cuomo, has for too many governors been essentially treated more like a palace guard than an actual professionalized protective detail. Uh, you know, looking out for the person occupying the office as opposed to what it had become, which is serving at times like a little bit more than kind of armed assistance to the governor. Sure. And one of the first decisions that was made in his administration 10 years ago was by Joe Percoco, who had informed the state police that the trooper who had historically been stationed at the bottom of the stairs in the executive mansion inside the residence would no longer be there. They kicked them out of the mansion, didn't want them around. So there's there had always been this sort of distrust between Cuomo and the state police protection detail. But as years went by, he began to exert control over who gets hired, including the offering a position we now know to a, a young female trooper that was allegedly sexually harassed by him or moving someone like Vincent Strafacci up through the ranks. And Strafacci was close with Percoco and, according to multiple sources, would do the bidding of the governor. If the governor, we now know, was going to events at black churches or or black community groups, he would ask that a black trooper or a black investigator be on the advanced team. And that what that meant was that that trooper or that investigator would be the one who would go there ahead of time and be sort of the face of the governor's administration, do a security check. And then when the governor arrived, would go out and they call it meet him at the curb and, and walk him in. But there were supervisors on the detail who were aghast at that and thought that was offensive to their professionalism, that they don't make decisions tactical decisions based on race. It's based on whose job it is that day. 
what are the solutions here? I mean, you're not an advocate, of course, but I mean, how would how would the state police like to see the detail interact with the executive chamber in order to prevent this type of, I think it's fair to call it a kind of abusive relationship from, or an, at least an exploitative relationship from, from developing? You know, the New York State Police Investigators Association had written or issued a statement saying that they wanted division, they call it division, it's the headquarters of the state police, to take control of the detail back at division rather than having it operate as sort of an autonomous troop of its own with a major at the top who reports to the governor rather than to a colonel or somebody else. They want that. And in our story Sunday, they had mentioned that in their talks, they said that management wants the same thing. So I think there it needs to, a governor to come in and, and a state police superintendent to also come in and, and agree to change the dynamic here to make sure, because this kind of abuse stretches back all the way to the to the Mario Cuomo era. And during Pataki, it really got out of control in terms of, you know, using that as sort of a, of a hit squad for governors. So because you do have very good sources within the state police, and I'm not giving any anything away because you acknowledged it in a story that you wrote the following day, Sunday, and appeared uh, online Monday, that noted that when the governor vacated the mansion, and I keep saying the governor, he's now the former governor, he left behind a family member, uh, and that is his very large dog, Captain. Yes. The explanation from the governor's senior advisor and spokesman was that the governor was dealing with a tropical storm and did not have a place for the dog apparently to come with them. So when they left the mansion and left with their belongings, and there was no member of the Cuomo family left behind except for the dog, there seemed to be no intention for them to come back. The explanation, though, got a little bit shaky, I think, when he suggested that the governor, when he had asked a mansion employee if he would take the dog and the troopers that we had talked to said he wanted to pawn the dog off. He he did no longer wanted the dog, maybe because he doesn't have the ability to care for them or, you know, he's living at his sister's and maybe she doesn't want the dog there. I'm not sure. So anyway, they, they suggested that he was just doing this temporarily so that he could go on vacation. But if we if we unpack that, that means that after the governor leaves office and is no longer a state employee, he would now have a state employee babysitting his dog for him. And that that in itself could cause a lot of, of turmoil and questions about whether that's appropriate or not. Either way, after our story was published online and they continued to say that this dog was not left alone, and on late Monday, Governor Cuomo had posted a photo of himself clutching Captain's face with his daughters looking on. And and as you had found out, Casey, the, the photo was from People Magazine more than a year ago. And the dog was not with him. In fact, the dog had been picked up by a Saratoga County boarder and trainer who, my understanding is, still has the dog. And I'm not sure what, what the future is for the dog. Maybe he's going to stay there for a few weeks until the governor gets a new place and, and moves in with him. I'm just not sure. This dog, we should say, is enormous. I mean, we're not talking about a Pekingese here. This is a very large dog who apparently has nipped at members of the former executive mansion household. Yes, he's a, he is, as they say in the dog world, a handful for sure. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, of course, the 47th governor of the state, Kathy Hochul, was sworn in at midnight on Monday night, Tuesday morning had another ceremonial swearing in mid-morning on Tuesday, and then gave an address on Tuesday afternoon to the state. And I'm ready to get to work as your governor to solve the big problems that this state faces. Your priorities are my priorities. A brief address, I think it's fair to say, just about 12 or 13 minutes, in which she laid out her top priorities for this period of, of transition. And there were three of them. 
battling the, the Delta variant of COVID-19, of course, an ongoing health crisis, making sure that pandemic aid, which has gone out extremely slowly, especially for renters and landlords, and also achieving a cultural change or beginning to work towards a cultural change in state government on issues like sexual harassment and ethics and transparency, you know, kind of writ large. You know, some of them are immediate, but that third one is a big challenge. Indeed. That will, I think, require dismantling JCO, possibly even restructuring the inspector general's office in a way where it cannot just become the protector of the governor's administration, which is arguably what it became under under Cuomo's administration. It seemed that any time there was a, a controversial investigation, it was largely kept hidden, whether it was the Tappan Zee Bridge or the DCJS sexual harassment scandal. That's going to be, require a lot. And going back to the length of the speech, that really set the tone. So many people focused on the fact that, that Governor Hochul laid out her, her plan in about 12 to 13 minutes, and it followed more than a year of Cuomo briefings where it struck me all the time when he would, he would come out to a press conference surrounded by people that he would introduce from his administration. And then he would go on to talk for sometimes 20 to 40 minutes without even calling on those people to talk. So they were more or less props to, to be there in case he stumbled, I think, on a question. But her sticking to her words that, you know, and summarizing everything that she needs to do, I think uh, it resonated with people for sure. And then final topic on Wednesday, the news just kept on coming with the announcement that Hochul was selecting Brian Benjamin, who is a state senator from Harlem, uh, who is a progressive and who is black, as her lieutenant governor. Uh, he was on the short list. It had been uh, it had been announced previously, but you know what can we what can we tell from this selection, which is really kind of, of course, considering the fact that over the course of the last thirteen years, two lieutenant governors have ended up becoming governor now. What does this choice tell us about Kathy Hochul and the fact that, of course, she is planning to run for a full term in 2022? I think what it tells us is that any grace period honeymoon she had with the GOP is over because they immediately seized on Benjamin's statements to calling for defunding the police, although I think his statements were more in line with not what some people think of that in terms of shutting down police departments, but more or less restructuring the NYPD and its multi-billion dollar budget so that they could have more accounting as to where program money is being spent, is it being effective. But the GOP was not happy with that selection, and it seems that they were they were ready to, to now make that an issue for the 2022 gubernatorial election. One last question, just kind of the slightly more personal one. You know, I became State House Bureau Chief in 2008. I did it until you took over in 2017. So I've been covering Andrew Cuomo or assisting in the coverage of Andrew Cuomo, as have you back when you were an investigative reporter and then in the various roles you've had since then. And of course, for the last four years, really intensely as Capitol Bureau Chief, it feels very much like the end of an era. You know, the, the way I've described it to people is it's a good thing that Captain Ahab dies at the end of Moby Dick because he might feel kind of lonely without uh, that kind of outsized presence in his life. I mean, do you do you kind of feel that way? You do. What drives us sometimes is to is to be the eyes and ears of the public to, to uncover corruption, to uncover wrongdoing, to prove that public officials are lying, perhaps you know. Um, and with the Cuomo administration it was a, kind of like drinking from a fire hose at times. And, and I will quite miss that, I think. As always, you can read more about all of the stories and the issues that we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. After the break, we'll take a look at how to avoid common real estate scams. I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Times Union. 
Join us for an ongoing discussion on major developments in the saga of Keith Raniere, co-founder of Nexium, the shadowy upstate New York organization at the center of the explosive federal investigation that resulted in Raniere's conviction on charges of extortion, sex trafficking, and more. We talk to former members of Nexium, discuss the latest news, and preview the likely next twists in this bizarre and disturbing story. You can find Nexium on trial at timesunion.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. Have you been looking for housing in the Capital Region? Maybe you've scrolled through some apartment listings on Zillow or hopped over to Realtor.com. Imagine you did that and you found the perfect listing, your dream house or apartment to rent. It almost seems too good to be true, you think. Well, you might be right. The Times Union's newest Hearst fellow, Shayla Cologne, came across a common real estate scam during her search for a residence here in the Capital Region. And she did what any good reporter would do, immediately investigated. I asked her what she found out. So I love the first line of this article. This is, it's just so gripping. You said, I was almost the victim of a rental scam, but they messed with the wrong woman. I love that. Tell me more, please. It stems from a firsthand experience. I recently moved to Albany to work with the Times Union and last minute, the apartment I was locking into fell through. So I scrambled and I started looking for a place and I came across this beautiful listing for a three bedroom home on realtor.com that was certainly more than I needed as a single woman, but I couldn't ignore it for all of its beauty. And I reached out And it ended up being a scam, but it definitely took some time before I came to that realization. And uh, the whole time I'm thinking, what are the odds that a scammer comes into contact with a reporter? It just doesn't look good for you, pal. (laughs) Um, I'm definitely going to write about this because it's, as I learned later, it's something that's incredibly common and just so unfortunate, to be honest. How did you find out that this was such a common thing? I knew that I wanted to get other people's experiences just to learn how common it is. So I started by speaking to a couple of community liaisons. So, uh, for example, I spoke to the executive director of the United Tenants of Albany. Uh, And then I reached out to the New York State Association of Realtors and spoke with their director. And in these conversations and and in speaking with the realtors who actually own the home and were selling it, I just learned, yeah, this is incredibly common. Um, I believe it was Jennifer from the New York State Association of Realtors who said, I hear about these at least once a week, which makes me think they're happening more frequently. And in speaking with the United Tenants of Albany, it turns out the director actually had a very similar experience a few years back in Bethlehem. And uh, someone (laughs) basically pulled the same gimmick on her. Wow, that is incredible. People say this is common. How common is it? Is there data that that shows how frequently this happens? Sure. So the New York State Department of Consumer Protection said that they've received about 239 real estate complaints since 2018. And while that might seem like a big number, I feel as though there's probably a lot more. Like Jennifer said, she's heard of one at she's heard of a scam at least once a week, which makes her think it's happening more frequently. So it's just a matter of people reporting it. So let's go back and take me through the exact experience you had. Like you saw this place for rent, you were interested in it, and just take me through what exactly happened. I was searching for homes and apartments in Albany on Realtor.com when I came across the listing. Uh, The home was at 24 Belvedere Avenue, and everything looked good on the listing. It gave all of the logistics of the home, the utilities. uh, And it just said, if you want to apply, reach out. So I reached out because I wanted to inquire a little bit. And I think a day or so later, I received an email and some red flags started to show uh, and just proved a little of discomfort for me. So the first thing was the email address itself. It was titled, Trust God. 
And in the initial okay. email, the person who claimed to be the home's owner was just basically giving me their life story, telling me that they worked in a couple of other states as a professor, and now they're working in Texas for an organization that is helping first responders and veterans with PTSD. And I just thought, this is so off. When you're inquiring for an apartment or a home, who gives you their whole life story like that? And uh, yeah. because I was so desperate, I sort of ignored it. So I filled out the application and I did so because the questions they were asking weren't too intrusive. I mean, as a reporter, I give out my cell phone number and email on a regular basis. So that was probably as intrusive as it got. And I just waited. The next day, I received another email and it was them saying, hey, we want to rent to you. We, we think you're the right fit. But in my head, I'm thinking, how do you know I'm the right fit? I could be a psychopath for all you know. You didn't ask me any questions. I decided to ignore the email and just not go ahead. I um I remember forwarding it to my boyfriend and just think it and sending it to him and saying, yeah, this looks pretty fishy, so I'm not going to proceed. And then I became a little curious the next day when they texted me. So at this point, now they're texting me and they're like, hey, we want to confirm the rental with you. And I was just ignoring it. But then I decided, you know what, let's let's do something for giggles. And I texted back and I said, hey, before I proceed with anything, I'd like to see the house. Can that be arranged? And of course, no answer. So that's when I finally confirmed, yeah, this is probably someone scamming. Wow. Now, when you talked to, you know, obviously the experts in the area, what were they saying about what people should do and what they should look out for? I mean, you already kind of outlined that through your experience, but is there, you know, two or three things that people can keep in mind when they're looking for rentals in the area or just in general that they should, you know, watch out for that are like the red flags, like you said? Definitely. So the state actually provides resources for people about these scams and what they should look out for. So one thing that definitely to keep in mind is if this is someone that is showing the listing on their own and not an accredited realtor or agency, um, maybe just be weary of those people and try to confirm as much as you can. So for example, public records, you can go to um, property records and just see who owns the home and just inquire that way. It also never hurts to do a drive-by and just see if there are any signs on the home or anything like that. Otherwise, people who don't want to show you the home or apartment and ask for money up front that's just like, ring the alarm. (laughs) This is a scam. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. That definitely sounds fishy to me. Are people being prosecuted for scamming others? Are people getting caught? Did you get any sense of that? So it's so interesting. With a scammer like such, I feel like they're professional to some extent. They certainly know what they're doing. And once you contact them, it's like a ghost in the wind. They they often use common names, So even if you look them up, you'll probably find dozens just within your area. But what was funny about this situation is I actually reached out to the organization that this person claimed to work for in Kansas City. And apparently they have gotten calls from all over the country about similar scams and someone posing as an affiliate of their organization. And whenever they try to sort of turn the tables on the scammer and reach out to them, it always leads to dead ends. So their lawyers looking into it, but they've come up short so far and it's actually unfortunate. (laughs) Now you ended up making contact with the actual owners of the house that you had initially expressed interest in that the scammers had, you know, kind of taken over the listing for. So what did the, the folks who own the house tell you? Sure. So his name's Brian Phelps. He's a realtor in the area. The way I found him was through a Zillow listing for the home that said it was for sale. So I just gave him a call and he immediately answered. And I remember saying, hey, is this house for sale? And he was like, yeah, it is. So I said, well, then I probably need to tell you something. And I explained what had happened and how essentially the listing was ripped off and uh, used for other illegitimate purposes. Um, And he had no idea. So he had no idea someone was trying to scam off of this listing. So by by kind of ripping off the listing, you mean they take the photos and, you know, the description of the property and, you know, repurpose it, right? Yeah, that's exactly what they do. And what's interesting is 
There wasn't an email that you could reach out to on the Realtor.com listing, aka the fake listing. You had to reach out through Realtor.com. So it's interesting to me that Realtor.com was able to connect me with this person and essentially had no verification um, of who this person was and whether or not they're actually the owner. But uh, those third-party sites have stipulations in their terms of service that pretty much protect them. So like once you're off the site and communicating with someone, they're not liable. Um, It's pretty much up to you. I am so glad that you did not fall for that scam and that you wrote about it because I think that that is something that people need to know, uh, valuable service. So thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, no, thanks, Jessica. It's always a pleasure. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall. We'll be back next week with another look inside the newsroom here at the Times Union. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks this week to Casey Seiler, Brendan Lyons, and Shayla Cologne for their reporting and contribution to this episode.